And um, I have to say, I've, I've really been blown away by the previous presentation and by uh, Pier Paolo. I think uh, um, I'm showing, in a way, uh, the same scheme, animal models and humans, but I'm really interested in adaptive immunity. And I think uh, that was a great uh, uh, um, uh, demonstration of how you can study innate immunity in, in, in the animals. Uh, I think innate Im um, adaptive immunity poses um, uh, further challenges. And the challenge is, is uh, uh, not so much the mutation that can be engineered in the mice, but rather the difference between the human and mouse genetics, uh, different even subtle immunodeficiencies in humans, uh, the host pathogen interaction, which is specifically um, uh, tuned uh, uh, and, 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 and decided between humans and pathogens, and uh, uh, diseases of humans which, uh, for which there is no equivalent in the mouse. So what we are interested in is to study the uh, B cell response and identify antibodies with the hope that we can develop uh, uh, better vaccines, immunotherapy, but also uh, through that to learn uh, new aspects of uh, um, the immune response. And I hope by the end of my talk to show you a very surprising finding of a new mechanism that generates diversity. Now, these are the antibodies. This is the sticky end of the antibodies, which I remind you is made by six uh, loops, uh, so-called CDR1, 2, and 3, 1 and 2 uh, encoded by the V gene, and CDR3 by the uh, junction of V, D, and uh, J. Now, the mechanisms that um, uh, generate antibody diversity are very well known. It's VDJ or VJ rearrangement occurring in bone marrow, and uh, in addition, somatic mutations. Now, these are genome editing events which are carried out by specific uh, enzymes that carry a big risk of, uh, um, you know, um, going wrong and uh, uh, can generate a lot of uh, lymphomas uh, and, uh, and uh, leukemias. What we are most interested in is actually, however, to understand what's the role of somatic mutation. And on textbooks, you find that they are required for affinity maturation, so essentially to make uh, antibodies that bind better. Uh, but um, maybe it's also important to uh, generate a repertoire of diverse, uh, more diverse antibodies, as I will argue. One of the questions is how many mutations are required to make a good antibody. If you make 100, if you need 100 mutations, it will be very difficult. And of course, where are there are other mechanisms of diversification. So these are the methods that we use to isolate the antibodies. You can very efficiently immortalize memory B cells and screen directly the antibodies, uh, the culture supernatants for, uh, for instance, neutralization or other functions. And we can also maintain in culture plasma cells, which are non-dividing, and do screening in a high-throughput fashion. You see here we screen something more than 10,000 uh, cultures to identify some uh, uh, rare uh, antibody-producing cells. So one of the outputs of this approach is actually uh, uh, shown here. This is a recent paper where, but uh, here is a message. In only four months, we can go from a sample of patient's blood to making a cell line that produces a MERS neutralizing antibody at more than five gram per liter. So this provides a very rapid reaction to, for instance, emerging diseases, like in this case. Uh, another example is actually that we don't need to make an educated guess. So we can take a target agnostic approach and simply ask the simple question, what is the best neutralizing antibody for a complex virus like cytomegalovirus? And uh, to a medical audience, I don't have to tell you why cytomegalovirus is a problem. So now what we found that surprisingly, we identify some very potent antibodies that recognize a novel a protein complex of five, uh, we call it a pentamer. And now these antibodies are now in phase two clinical trial, but also we have been able through this information to produce the pentamer as a vaccine that in a preclinical model works extremely well in inducing high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And through the same approach, now we have identified the cellular receptors for the, for the pentamer and the trimer. So the target agnostic approach, I think, has an advantage, especially for complex pathogens. So for instance, other herpes viruses, uh, EBV, just to name one, bacteria, fungi, we don't know which are the targets of the most uh, potent blocking and neutralizing antibody. Parasites, I'll make an example for malaria. But here is my little contribution to the discussion on tumor cells. Tumor cells are obviously very complex antigens. We know that there are mutations. And I think there are now new opportunities in patients treated with uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, now, uh, because there is a 
need for linked recognition to make an antibody, it means that if we have an antibody, we must also have a T cell that has seen the same antigen. And so I think this uh, approach will provide a shortcut to identify T cell antigen in tumors, and which uh, you know, can be done the hard way uh, through proteomic and genomic approach. Uh, but uh, I think this provides a shortcut. And here I've listed two examples of uh, uh, two studies published recently in Science that actually illustrate this principle, not, not applied to tumors, this principle in the field of uh, uh, autoimmune diseases. Now, the question that has kept my lab uh, occupied for a while is, uh, is the following. Um, is the diversity of viral glycoprotein. You know that there are many influenza viruses, and H1 and H3, which are circulating in uh, human population, are actually quite different. There is only 35% amino acid identity between these two hemagglutinins, uh, very much like uh, 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 metapneumovirus and uh, uh, respiratory syncytial virus. Now, uh, the the idea is, was therefore to look whether there would be a rare antibodies that could actually neutralize uh, viruses uh, uh, which are uh, so different from each other. And this is uh, the first example. This is uh, we call FI6. is an antibody that actually b neutralizes all influenza viruses, not only H1 and H3, but also uh, animal uh, influenza viruses. It binds here to the stem of the hemagglutinin. And interestingly, does not select escape mutants. You know that viruses can escape by mutation from the antibodies, but this site is very conserved because it's a functional site, and the virus cannot escape with a single mutation from this antibody. Now, it was interesting to uh, realize that the unmutated ancestor of this antibody, what does it mean? Uh, we we essentially revert the somatic mutation to the germline. So we look at the original antibody that gave rise, original B cell that gave rise to the FI6. Now, the or unmutated ancestor had high affinity, but only for group one. And through mutation, it became capable of recognizing and neutralizing also group two. So what does it mean? It means that the mutations were not required for affinity maturation because the affinity was high already. But they re were required to make the antibody broader, so in a sense, better capable of recognizing related antigens. And this is another story, very similar, in a sense. This is MP8. This is an antibody that neutralizes actually four different viruses two human viruses, RSV and MPV, plus the bovine and the mouse uh, viruses, does not select escape mutants. And once again, the unmutated ancestor has high affinity, but only for RSV. And through mutations, the, you generate a variant that now can be selected by MPV, and you have an antibody that neutralizes both viruses. OK, now, if you want to make a vaccine based on this concept, uh, um, um, you have to understand how you generate these broad neutralizing antibodies. So essentially, these are the questions that are interesting to address. Why is the antibody response to the stem of the hemagglutinin, the broadly influenza neutral antibody, so rare? I and mean, only some individuals make it, and very low titers. Um, and uh, how many mutations are required to make a high affinity antibody? And in fact, uh, uh, in the HIV, our colleagues working in HIV suggest that you may need up to 100 mutations to make a good antibody, or you may need to have antibodies with unusual features, such as a very long uh, CDR3, which obviously uh, reflects a very rare uh, precursor. Now, so this is a, a summary of a study that, the, 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 that uh, was a, a published study. And, and so essentially, we identified three main requirements to make an antibody to, that neutralizes all influenza viruses. And they are easy requirements. So first of all, is you need a, a, a particular polymorphic VH169. So this is interesting, because it means that not all individuals can make these antibodies, but only those that have a, an allele with phenylalanine 54. OK? So this is the first example of a good antibody response, which is uh, controlled uh, by uh, genetic polymorphisms. Second, you need a tyrosine at position 98 in a 13-amino acid CDR3. This is a very common motif. You find it in many antibodies. 
And then with a single mutation at residue 52, you reach high affinity. So it's very rapid. You need a single mutation. And in fact, uh, the way we find that is that we reconstruct the genealogy trees of the antibodies, and you see that uh, you know, the original antibody doesn't bind poorly. Um, uh, the first branch point binds uh, very well. And in fact, uh, a single uh, mutation is sufficient to bind very well. But it's very intriguing that if you now take a highly mutated antibody and, and revert the first two mutations, it still binds. So, it, so the solution is very redundant. You continue to accumulate uh, favorable mutations. This was actually a very surprising and interesting uh, finding. So back to the question. Well, certainly, these requirements are not very uh, uh, difficult to meet. Uh, you know, if you have the right gene, a single mutation, you can have the right antibody. So what is limiting our capacity to make good antibodies that would neutralize all influenza viruses? I think we have to think now about T cell help. And fortunately, we have great expertise in the, in the lab on that, in the institute. And or the other possibility is that the uh, instability of the antigen, that the, that the stem of the hemagglutinin will uh, uh, fold uh, in the post-fusion conformation and the vaccine that we use would not be good enough. So to summarize, um, affinity maturation that you find in textbook, yes, we can observe it, but it's usually very, very rapid. And uh, somatic mutations continue, and through this mechanism, they can generate a whole repertoire of antibodies that diversifies the response. And so antibodies with favorable properties, for instance, to cross-react on different antigens can be uh, selected. Uh, you know, when you have a positive effect, you always have a, a side effect. There is a dark side in, in this aspect, that, that by introducing somatic mutation, uh, you can, of course, not only uh, generate tumors, but you can also generate autoantibodies. And in fact, autoantibodies appear uh, from several studies, including from our own lab, to be, to a large extent, generated through an uh, uh, unfortunate uh, series of uh, somatic mutations. Now, in the last um, 10 minutes, I will um, tell you about another project that actually uh, started when we were visiting um, uh, uh, Kilifi in Kenya, and there is a, a very uh, interesting, I uh, was visiting this institute, the, the Camry Institute, and uh, and we decided to uh, join forces to um, uh, address another, uh, I think, uh, medically very uh, important problem, which is the, uh, the finding a vaccine for malaria. And uh, the malaria parasites uh, express on the surface of the infected erythrocytes the so-called variant surface antigens, which are required uh, for, the, for the infected parasites to adhere to the endothelia or to other uh, 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 red blood cells. Now, uh, these antigens are the target of acquired immunity, so antibodies to these antigens protect, but the problem is that, is that the parasites can easily escape because it has a large number of such antigens. There are 60 PFMP1, 150 Refin, and 100 Stevor, and they are polymorphic. They are different from strain to strain, and they are clonally expressed. So it's a real nightmare, so it's a great uh, ways that the pathogen can escape from the host antibody response. Now, what um, uh, we have done, we started to uh, screen uh, Kenyan plasma, uh, about 500, and this was done by a very talented uh, uh, student uh, from University of Oxford, which, which went to Kenya to do this work, uh, Joshua Tan. So he screened uh, the Kenyan plasma to find plasma that would form mixed agglutinates. So here are parasites from three different uh, uh, strains uh, stained with different colors. And this is a serum that has uh, uh, antibodies that then agglutinate individual parasites. And this is a serum that has antibodies that agglutinate all the parasites. And we identify a few of these individuals. And then we use our system to isolate monoclonal antibodies and screen the antibodies against this panel up here of uh, eight different uh, uh, parasite isolates. And you see there are two types of antibodies, those that recognize a single isolate, these are supposed to be the common ones, and from these two individuals, we isolate many antibodies that recognize all the isolates. And this is one example, you see on the y-axis DNA, the parasites, and on the x-axis, the binding of the antibodies. So the antibody recognizes a fraction of the parasites in all uh, isolates. Now, when we sequence the cDNA, we find that these antibodies, which are, I would say, have a conventional structure. They have a, a, 
uh, a VDJ. But these broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, were very surprising. They have a big insertion of approximately 100 amino acids between the V and the DJ. Okay, all of them. Now, uh, these are, the insertion is slightly different in the two donors uh, in terms of flanking regions, but the core of this insertion is 100 amino acids, uh, which are 92 to 98 percent homologous to the extracellular domain of LIR1. LIR1 is a collagen binding receptor uh, which is encoded on chromosome 19. Immunoglobulin genes are on chromosome 14, the, the heavy chain. Okay, so in both donors, you have this big insertion between the V and the DJ. Now, um, for in each of the two individuals, the, these antibodies are all clonally related. They have essentially the same sequence, which has undergone a huge diversification through addition of, soma of uh, somatic uh, mutations. Now, if you now, uh, because now we have the cells, we can look at the genomic DNA, and what you find in the genomic DNA is that uh, the insert is a little bit larger. In donor D, actually, there is an insert also from chromosome 13, uh, which is largely spliced out, okay? Uh, and uh, at the boundaries of this insert, there are uh, low-score recombination signal sequences, which suggest, but certainly don't prove, that RAG1 and RAG2 might be involved in this uh, process of uh, 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 DNA transposition. So um, what is required for this antibody to bind? So we made several uh, chimeric antibodies, and to make a long story short, you can substitute all the, com all the components of these antibodies, including the V, the DJ, and the light chain, and provided you leave the mutated exon, the, all these variants will still bind. In fact, you can take the mutated exon alone, stick it to an FC, and this will bind. So the only selected component which is required for binding is the mutated exon of uh, layer one. And here is the exon. So in his, uh, uh, um, the layer one on chromosome 19 binds collagen, but, um, uh, but we have identified here uh, somatic mutations that, are, that lead to a loss of collagen binding, as well as somatic mutations that increase the binding to uh, malaria uh, 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 to uh, parasites, to infected uh, erythrocytes. Now, once that we have this antibody, we went and, uh, and reached for uh, uh, positive parasites, uh, um, uh, blotted, uh, uh, made uh, Western blots uh, on uh, um, erythrocyte ghosts or immunoprecipitate, and you see that the antibody recognizes a band of approximately 40 kilodalton, and then by mass spec, we identified the antigen as uh, uh, at least uh, two different refins, and uh, here is a formal demonstration that the antibodies bind to a particular set, not all the refins, to a, a subset of uh, refins. Uh, there are about 150 refins in uh, the parasite uh, genome. Uh, the antibodies uh, can uh, effectively opsonize infected erythrocytes, suggesting that in vivo they may have, uh, 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 they may be effective against, uh, against uh, uh, malaria. So here, uh, surprisingly, we have, we come up with a new model of generating antibody diversity, which is, this is interchromosomal DNA transposition. In this case, layer one from chromosome 19, this generates a, a backbone that can, with a few mutations, can develop into a very potent uh, malaria reactive antibodies. Of course, um, if I have the same uh, transposition, uh, this clone will not be selected because have not been exposed to malaria. Uh, but um, this appears to be uh, a frequent event, at least in individuals which are exposed uh, to uh, the uh, parasite. Now, um, this is my final slide. So we have found broadly reactive antibodies against Rifin, and our colleagues who work on malaria are very excited. But um, I think I should uh, um, put some water on the fire to say that, you know, we don't know whether these antibodies are protective. They recognize only a fraction, they, they are very broad, they recognize every parasite, but only a fraction of those. Can parasites escape uh, without losing fitness? Uh, will be an interesting experiment. Can we design a vaccine based on the conserved reef in epitopes? It's a challenge, we don't have a reef in structure, but we are certainly going to work on that. Uh, but it's interesting that these reefings are expressed also on sporozoites, and so 
if uh, they are functionally expressed uh, uh, and uh, we may have uh, a, a way of uh, designing a vaccine that can not only take care of the blood stage but also uh, of the uh, transmission. <coughs> so much more work to do. Now, the DNA transposition is for me the most exciting aspect. So, so this obviously is a rare somatic event. In these two individuals, there was only one clone. Uh, but um, now we have found at least another individual in that happened. And you know, it can definitely contribute to antibody diversity because these individuals have very high levels of these broadly neutralizing antibodies in the serum. So the question to me is how frequent is their one transposition? And where does it transpose? Does it only go into the uh, VDJ boundary, which is an ideal place to insert an extra domain because it's a loop? or can go somewhere else. And I think we have preliminary evidence that it can also go in other, can also target other sites in the immunoglobulin uh, loci. Uh, what's the mechanism of transposition? Uh, we know very little about it, but we know at least that in one individual, the two alleles, uh, uh, because this individual was heterozygous, are still on chromosome 19. So we suspect that it must be some kind of retrotransposition. Um, for which we don't know of any precedent. Um, can they give rise to other specificity? Well, we can speculate that maybe some anti-collagen antibodies may be generated in this way. There are collagen autoantibodies. Um, you know, why not to use um, this domain, which is actually collagen binding? Uh, we are looking into that. And, uh, and finally, and to me this is the most important question, uh, uh, is this really a very rare event that applies only to layer one, or is this the tip of the iceberg? And, and, this, uh, and there are many other uh, domains that can be uh, transposed into the immunoglobulin loci, and through mutation they can acquire uh, binding uh, to different, uh, uh, to different uh, antigens. Okay, I, I, I should close here, acknowledge the people who did the work. Uh, I mentioned Joshua Tan, has, uh, who uh, actually started this project in Kilifi and now has been working in the last year in our institute. Uh, Catherine Pieper has done uh, all the molecular biology, especially the characterization of the, uh, the genomic versus uh, uh, cDNA uh, structure, and Luca Piccoli for all the expression uh, and uh, um, and, uh, uh, and mapping of, uh, of the mutants, and this has been a collaboration with the group, uh, the Camry group in Cliffy. So thank you, and take your questions.